Hey, I'm going to be doing a video about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or just the uncertainty principle sometimes. So I'm going to be telling you what this principle implies, what it's about, what the consequences are. So let's get started. All right, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle implies two things pretty explicitly. Is that one of them is that, um, again, sorry if the green screen effect is good. I know sometimes if I do like that, you can like see through my arm or something, but you know, iMovie has its limitations. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is really about two things. One of them is that if you know the position of something exactly, you'll know nothing about the momentum. And if you know the momentum of a particle exactly, you'll know nothing about the position. So this is pretty familiar in quantum mechanics. The second is that a particle can sort of appear out of nowhere, if you will, um, and violate the laws of conservation of matter and energy. Uh, but then it has to disappear within a certain time frame. So let's get started with the first point of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is that you uh, can't know the position and momentum of a particle both at the same time. So take, for example, a humble electron just sitting right there. There's an electron, right, in empty space. So now, why can't we know the position of this electron and its momentum? Well, you might think this is a law that says, like, if you try to measure them both, you'll get something like the double slit experiment, where your measurement will just change or invalidate itself. Well, it's simply the fact that given all the particles, you have to use a particle to measure something, right? So normally we would use photons, which are light, like in a microscope or something. You have to use a particle to measure another particle, obviously. So, because if you didn't use a particle, there'd be nothing there, or an, or an antiparticle. So, to, to measure the m position of electron, let's say we want to know the position exactly. We have down here, we have like a gamma emitter, okay? Because gamma, if we want to know the position of the uh, electron as precisely as we possibly can, which we want to do in this case, um, we're going to emit the shortest wavelengths possible so that we can get the least uh, error in our measurement. So down here we have a gamma emitter. It's in gamma, gamma waves, which have the uh, shortest wavelength of all the electromagnetic spectrum, so that we're going to choose photons uh, for that reason. Up here we have a detector. This detector is going to measure where the gamma waves sit. And we have an electron right here. So the gamma waves are emitted by the gamma wave emitter, and they go up, and they hit the electron, and they'll scatter off the electron, and the other ones will pass through, and we'll have a pretty detailed picture of exactly where our electron is. We'll know its position almost exactly, not 100% exactly, because the gamma waves do have a wavelength at all, so that means there will be about twice, two times the wavelength of a gamma um, error, because on, on both sides. Um, so there's that. So we're going to have a little bit of uncertainty. But now you're saying, why can't we also know the momentum? Well, because when a gamma wave hits an electron, it's energetic enough to move an electron around. It's energetic enough that an electron will be, in, if it's in an atom, knocked to the next electron shelf. Or if it's in free space, the uh, electron, the gamma, uh, gamma waves will have enough energy to actually move the electron. So in that case, we're going to know the position almost precisely, but we're not going to know anything about the momentum because the gamma waves have changed the momentum. So now, say, uh, so, that, so you're going to say, well, why, what if we just decrease the wavelength of the waves so they didn't have enough energy? Well, if you decrease the wavelength of the waves and we go radio waves or x, x uh, radio waves, uh, which have a much lower wavelength, then yeah, sure, the radio waves aren't going to move the electron as much, but then we're going to have, since radio waves have a huge uh, wavelength, then um, I think it's like a meter or something like that even, since they have a huge wavelength, we're not going to know at all where the electron is. So that we're going to know the momentum almost precisely because the radio waves aren't, aren't going to do hardly a thing. But we're not going to know the position at all. We're going to know it roughly to like a meter or something like that. So that's, you know, an electron is really small. I'll put the spec up here. I don't know off memory how large it is. Um, but it's, it's very small. So a meter is huge to an electron. So that's the reason, is that you can't measure position and momentum exactly both at the same time, is because whatever you do to measure the momentum, you won't know it's, it's too uncertain for the um, position. And if you try to measure the position, it will change the momentum. So that's, that's, that's the reason why. That's how the law works. And it's proven to be true. You can't know position and momentum exactly. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other. So that's the first part of the Heisenberg uncertainty. Okay, so the second part of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that um, particles can appear out of nowhere, literally nowhere. There can be nothing, there can be a particle, but then the particle has to disappear. Now, obviously, creating a particle from absolutely nothing, which is what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle allows, uh, obviously violates the laws of conservation of matter and energy, because you, you have no matter and no energy at first, 
then you have matter and energy, and then you don't anymore. So how is this possible that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle allows us to violate, perhaps the, the conservation laws are really sort of, if you will, the key, like the underlying structure of the universe so far, the best underlying structure that we know are the laws of conservation. Um, there's like 12 of them, I think, uh, but matter and energy are the two what people are most familiar with. Anyway, how is it that physics allows us to violate some of the most um, underlying laws of our universe? Uh, but the Heisenberg uncertainty principle does allow us to do that. It basically says that there are uncertainties in quantum mechanics. This is a quantum mechanics law, by the way, obviously, because it's dealing with uncertainties and probabilities, and quantum mechanics is really all about uncertainties and probabilities, and really predicts, quantum mechanics can predict the probability of something that will happen, but quantum mechanics will not tell you what is going to happen. It will tell you it's most likely something will happen, but it can't tell you if something else will happen that's less likely. Anyway, that's just a little, like, blurb on quantum mechanics. So anyway, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that if we have a particle here, it can emit another particle, or another particle can be created out of nothing. So we'll take the first, uh, second example of a particle being created out of nothing. We have nothing here. Say it emits, just n not emits, an uh, electron is spontaneously created, right? This violates the laws of conservation of matter and energy. Now the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says this is permitted by the universe as long as the electron is to disappear again within a certain amount of time, very short. Now, the Heisenberg uncertainties principle says that the, the less energy or l mass, they're the same thing uh, because of E equals mc squared. Um, if you want to know that, just E equals mc squared, c in natural units is 1, so E equals m. You know, energy is the same thing as mass. So um, it basically says the more uh, massive a particle is that's created out of nothing, then the less time it has to exist, or the stronger the force the particle is carrying, the less time it has to exist. So say something like an electron is created. It has um, 511 uh, electron volts of energy, um, pretty sure. So that's very low. So an electron can be created, and it has quite a bit of time, relatively speaking, before it will disappear into nothing again. Now say something like the W boson, which is very massive, it's going to be spontaneously created and almost instantly spontaneously um, disappear relative to the electron. Obviously, relative to human's perspective of time, both of them happen instantaneously. You couldn't tell. So, but relative to an electron, a W boson has almost no time because Heisenberg uncertainty principle says is it can be created of nothing, but because it's so massive and the force it carries is so strong that it's going to have to spontaneously go away as well. Uh, within a very short amount of time because it's more massive. So it basically says nature will permit the breaking of its laws, but the more blatant the breaking of the law, more blatant meaning the higher uh, energy level of the particle, um, then the less time you have to do it. So, um, you know, come up with all the analogies for police and breaking the law and whatever stuff you have. So, you know, you could say, you know, the, the, wor the worse law you're breaking, the less time you have to do it if you bribe a police officer or whatever. I don't know. I, I'm, I don't bribe police, police officers. I do with physics. So that's, the, that's what the second part of quant um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states is that uh, if a particle can be created out of nowhere, but the more massive and the stronger the force the particle carries, uh, the less time it has to exist. So this applies to how bosons mediate a force like I did in the last video. Like I said, because um, a particle can spontaneously emit a particle, a virtual particle. So say this particle is a photon. Okay, it can spontaneously emit a photon. And because a photon has very little mass, um, the photon is going to be able to survive for quite a long time. Because, in fact, a photon has zero mass, zero s mass. Obviously, if it's moving, it's going to have some uh, mass, but um, zero s mass. So, because uh, the mass is going to be in the energy of the particle, it gets complicated, uh, but equals mc squared equals m, like I said before. So, the photon has quite a long time because it has a zero rest mass. So, uh, this particle can emit a photon, and then the photon has quite a bit of time before it has to go back into the particle. Say the particle's a proton, the photon, the proton emits a photon, and the photon has a limited amount of time, but quite a long time relative to other particles because it has a zero rest mass, before it has to be reabsorbed by the pho uh, proton, and then once it's reabsorbed by the proton, it just disappears just like a particle c uh, created out of nothing. So, um, it's, it's, by the way, it's really hard to not use the expression thin air in this video because thin air implies there is air. It's, it's funny the way these things don't lend themselves to physics very well. But what do you expect? So, um, that's, that's how it applies to the other video is that those virtual particles getting emitted by the uh, real particles, if you will. By the way, virtual particles and real particles, both equally real. 
just virtual particles is sort of a very loosely defined term for a Heisenberg uncertainty principle particle. A virtual particle basically means a particle created due violating the laws of conservation of matter and energy, but is created but is allowed to be existent for a small amount of time due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So as in the last video, particles can just spontaneously emit particles and then they fall back into the particle or spontaneously emit particles and it gets absorbed by another particle to transfer force. That's allowable due to the laws of conservation, uh, sorry, due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, violates the laws of conservation of matter and energy. Now, the reason that I drew in the last video, say the gluons for the, uh, sorry, the mesons for the um, protons, protons emit mesons, which carry the strong force, is because a meson is much more massive than a photon, a photon having zero rest mass. A meson can have a few mega electron volts of um, rest mass. So uh, the reason the mesons have a shorter range, the reason the strong force has such a short range, is because it's a very strong force. And so since it's such a strong force, uh, it has a lot less time, those virtual particles have a lot less time to exist due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because the force it carries is so strong. And in the case of the meson, um, the mesons have a lot of mass. Um, compared to something like a photon. So they have less time to be emitted by the proton and reabsorbed by the proton, or less time to be uh, emitted by the proton and absorbed by, the, by another particle um, that also uh, has, takes part in the strong force. So uh, that's the reason strong force has a limit of time, is because obviously particles can't travel at uh, instantaneous speeds. The maximum speed anything can travel is the speed of light, and since mesons have mass, they're not traveling at the speed of light, so they can maximum travel 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. So because there's a limited time and a limited speed, that means they have a limited area, a limited range. And since the photons have zero rest mass, they have a lot larger range. So that's why the strong force is only coupling at very short distances is because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle saying that the strong force is so strong it has very small amounts of time for its virtual particles to exist. So uh, thanks for watching. I hope you've learned a bit about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Again, I apologize for my bad green screen, but like I said, I just use iMovie because I'm too cheap to pay. So thanks for watching.